And the analogy I, I always like to use is reverse coal mining, because clearly we've been mining coal since the beginning of the industrial revolution. And through bar char, we're essentially uh, reversing this uh, process. So essentially CO2 is used in photosynthesis uh, to make plants and trees, which are then is used as feedstocks for producing biochar. The Biochar Demonstrator Project is one of five demonstrator projects that were funded by UKRI. And the idea is to look at biochar, which is it's essentially anthropogenic charcoal. So uh, we take biomass, we heat it to very high temperatures under low oxygen conditions, and that creates like a charcoal. And that's a very stable form of carbon. So in, in this case, we're looking at putting it in agricultural soils, but that may also be in peats, um, or in other settings, uh, even just putting it in one big area like a, a landfill, uh, that, that carbon is then stored for long periods of time, somewhere between 100 or 1,000 years, uh, potentially longer. What we think is the best for dictating uh, regulations and policy is evidence obtained at scale. So in our trials on arable land, pasture land, the farmers will just carry on as normal. We're not dictating what they're going to do with the uh, land because that's what's going to occur in reality. So there are two main systems that we're studying uh, during the, the course of this project. So there's uh, arable systems, uh, which are cropping systems, annual cropping systems, and grassland systems, which are a lot more permanent. We need to test whether biochar is applicable to the UK in terms of, I mean, it definitely works in terms of carbon storage, um, but whether it's going to have an impact on other ecosystem services that are provided uh, from agricultural soils particularly. Um, that's what we're really interested in, to make sure there's no kind of negative effects on soil health. So the issue with all these benefits, they are very much dependent on soil and crop type, bar char will help retain moisture in soil, it will retain nutrients in soil, and clearly, if that is the case, can you actually use uh, less uh, fertiliser? The obvious advantage is reduced fertiliser use will uh, filter through and mean reduced CO2 uh, emissions from fertiliser uh, production. So one of the things we're doing, which is shake out deployment uh, program, is the current guidelines say, yeah, it's fine, you can apply one tonne of bar char per hectare per year, but if you actually do the sums, that is not necessarily going to be a huge contribution to the 2050 target for greenhouse gas removal. So in our trials, we've upped that to 10 tonnes per hectare, and 10 tonnes might sound to be a lot, but if it is, tilled, mixed into a depth of 20 centimetres, it's only halfway percent of the uh, soil organic matter. So we do have evidence you can go way, way beyond uh, that limit. We think that will give regulators uh, valuable uh, information to uh, extend the level of additions which are considered safe. There is plenty of data at laboratory scale, but to help regulators in terms of quantifying the additional uh, carbon benefits, we really need uh, much more data at a uh, field scale. It is crucial that your process does produce stable bar char because if it is not producing stable bar char, then the income you will attract through carbon trading will be reduced. If the bar char is made at too low temperature, there is evidence that it will degrade over relatively short time scales. If you are sequestering carbon, you need the evidence that the carbon will be around for hundreds and hundreds of years. You're not going to get carbon leakage uh, back into the uh, atmosphere and essentially we've got a method which removes the smaller carbon rings and leaves the bigger carbon rings behind and that is our uh, measure of uh, bar char persistence.
and it's very easy now to make uh, recommendations uh, in terms of bar chart specification uh, so that it will survive for periods of uh, thousands of years. So bar chart production is going to be on, on a localised scale. The reason is transporting feedstocks which might contain a lot of water will have significant uh, carbon emissions. During the preparation, roughly half the carbon you've got in your starting biomass, whether that is uh, wood or another feedstock, ends up in the bar char. The other half is released as a volatile material. Uh, this can be combusted and the process does require some of that energy, but there is a significant level of energy left for export either or as heat of power, so bar char production can be uh, integrated, for example, with uh, local or district uh, heating schemes. You could see small cooperatives coming together where you can get the means of production at a scale where the uh, environmental impact is going to be minimal, and that already is uh, happening on the continent. The issue, and this really brings in the discipline of life cycle analysis is ideally you should be using a feedstock where if you did nothing to it, that would be rapidly converted to uh, greenhouse gases. We are also exploring alternative feedstocks. Um, so that be uh, potentially biosolids, um, which are anaerobically digested sewage sludge. So it's a kind of a waste product from wastewater processing. That's applied to land at the moment, but it's also got a lot of bad things in it, potentially uh, organic pollutants, uh, viral DNA. And if you char biosolids, potentially that breaks a lot of those things down and it might be safe to apply to land, uh, or at least it reduces the amount of volume that you've then got to transport to, to wherever you're going to take it. Feedstock cost is one of the main uh, things that will increase the biochar production cost. But our target is to use the uh, waste materials, which make the feedstock cost to reduce to a significant amount. So we are developing models to identify um, optimum uh, biochar production uh, facility locations and their scales and at the same time, uh, which feedstock uh, in what amount should be supplied to the production facilities. So we are uh, trying uh, with the whole uh, UK available feedstocks. The target is to achieve minimum cost and minimum uh, carbon emission. So we identify the optimum scenario to achieve that. Uh, because we are developing business models, it needs to satisfy the stakeholders in, in the biochar production process. We are doing interviews to know the stakeholders' perspective on the biochar production and application on their lands. So with the outcomes from a life cycle economic assessment, we are trying to provide guidelines for the policies to benefit the, everyone in the supply chain. In terms of the UK, you know, we don't have a huge amount of land. And I think collectively for demonstrators are focusing on what are the benefits of co-application of uh, approaches. So we've been working quite closely with the peat demonstrator um, and there's quite a lot of evidence that if you put biochar in the soil and re-wet it, um, it can suppress the methane emissions that you'd otherwise get, um, so it reduce the overall greenhouse gas flux from the soil, but also increase soil carbon at the same time, which is obviously very beneficial. And the same with the perennial biomass cropping, so if you can get carbon into the soil before you put your perennial biomass crop on top of it, that's very beneficial as well. Clearly, one needs to know how long the effect is. Is it just an initial transit effect or is it long term? And, and again, this is another area where more data is needed to be able to quantify the uh, additional uh, carbon benefits you are getting uh, on top of the uh, ton of carbon in bar char that is going into the, in, into the ground. Evidence is bar char is gathering pace it's not difficult to envisage an industry that could be using one, two million tonnes of bar char 
by 2030, 2035, then this would start to represent a significant contribution to the uh, 2050 uh, green, green, greenhouse gas uh, removal target.